Deepa is a student of mine, did her PhD under my supervision, lost her father just two days before she was able to come here. Her father also was a student of mine, a classmate who also did PhD with, under my supervision. Two instances, the father and the daughter did their PhD dissertations under my supervision. I'm very close to the family. So she asked me that if someone can present the paper on her behalf. So I asked Mati, can I speak on her behalf? And here I am speaking on her behalf. The title is Diasporic Creativity as a non-Aristotelian form of communication. Since creative productions, especially in the literary forms, <coughs> are expected to keep pace with the radical transformations that have a direct or indirect impact on the modes of thinking and living, and consequently on the modes of perception and presentation, the tools and parameters to approximate a text with all its multiple textualities and intellectual complexities also need to be altered, amended, or expanded. Multiplicity of a text and possibilities of meanings demand a fuller and fairer deconstruction of linguistic construction and structural intricacies. It may sound axiomatic, but the fact remains that general semantics breaks away from the traditionally established notions and betrays a novel and comprehensive approach. This approach, the paper believes, can offer highly perceptive and productive re results in understanding the multifarious ways of a text, especially the nature and texture of a diasporic text. Diasporic writing is rightfully assuming an overarching dimension in the realms of literary and intellectual discourses today. Diaspora, as you all know, etymologically has a Greek origin and implies dispersal, arrival, and consequently dislocation and relocation with both an its intense intellectual, emotional, actual, and extended associations. We are all aware of the varieties of the nature of diaspora. It can be forced movement of people, or it can be a voluntary movement of people from their home land to a new place. This movement and settlement, nevertheless, is not a simplistic phenomenon. There is, in fact, much more than meets the eye. The diasporic interpretation and critical attempts have often confined themselves to what is obvious, more specifically to the emotional turmoil, cultural tension, tensions, and socioeconomic restraint and restrictions. The prevailing Aristotelian system, its linguistic structure and, and fixity or rigidity, consequentially still seems to be looming large over the critical domain. Application of the non-Aristotelian mode of methodology, the paper believes, can bring about fresher perspective to the literary and critical production. This mode can not, can not only approximate a literary or intellectual production in a comprehensive manner, but it can also approximate the complexities of the creative consciousness as it operates in the given conditions. The social, political, social, psychological, cultural <coughs> pressures that implicitly or explicitly impinge upon the linguistic dimension, which ultimately remains the sole medium of textual construction and, of course, primary domain of the non aristotelian mode. B.Y. Quadis, when he's here, he's quoted everywhere mm -hmm. in India. So Bruce Quadis has uh, rightly asserted that the Aristotelian, sorry, Aristotelian worm within the apple of human knowledge blocked the advancement of up-to-date scientific viewpoints and attitudes. Basic Aristotelian assumptions about how the world works, about the world, and this operation has remained embedded and embodied in the structures of language and logic. <coughs> the Aristotelian rules of logical system enunciated by the followers about 2,000 years ago still are considered visible basis for sound reasoning. The law of identity, which constitutes an important place in Aristotelian domain, 
attributes rigidity to anything that comes under its purview. It asserts that things are subject to change. This change, however, should not change the essence of the thing. It should remain unchanged. The oft quoted example is, is there is a NS in A always. The problems of mutation in, of in, in the inherited essence and structure, the net impenetrability notwithstanding is a moot proposition here. It is in terms of identification, existence, and essence of the things Aristotle overemphasized. An essentialistic approach is created and perpetuated. This approach is tinged with a color of rigidity. Creative consciousness, certainly, in, as non-Aristotle and more does, perceives the things not in their fixity and finality, but in fluidity and flux. And it is in this perception of reality, things, and essence, which non-Aristotelian mode may or may not have discarded or discredited, but it certainly has outlined the limitations of the system as the laws of thought. Diasporic creativity is continually confronted with these issues of identity, essence, existence, reality, and mapping the territory much more than the creative consciousness operating in indigenous ambience. Displaced and dislocated, the writers of diaspora are bound to be hypersensitive to the nature and texture of reality they are confronted with. Aristotle and Golden Means will help, will surely help these writers to take up a rational view rather than taking up an extremist viewpoint. non aristotelian mode, therefore, will prove to be a highly productive methodology to access and interpret a diasporic literary production in terms of the creative perception and dialogic presentation of reality. Geographically and consequentially, or consequentially, culturally, as we all know, that geography and culture are inextricably related, uprooted creative consciousness is highly agonized and highly sensitized consciousness. And it abstracts reality in a different way. It perceives reality exactly in the way what it appears to be, but it also perceives much more than what apparently it is not. Preoccupation with the easiness of the situation of things and things will reduce the creativity of the product to one, dimension, one dimensionality and preclude the possibilities of multiplicity or multidimensionality. The diasporic creative consciousness therefore transcends what is appeared to be, uh, what, is, what is apparent and penetrates beneath the deceptive intricacies of the appearance. It probes the illusion of the reality and reality engendered by an illusion. The A, it is invariably mentioned in general semantics and commonplace manner, never remains equal to another way. However, the law of identity A is A is a metaphorical, is a metaphysical statement that everything is what it is and not something else. In other words, everything is identical with the same in all respects with itself. A text cannot and should not be taken to be an inert records of morphological, lands morphological landscape of passive reflection of the world of objects. J.B. Huckley deconstructs the structure of power hidden in it. To quote him, maps are never value-free images. They're not themselves true or false, both in the selectivity of their content and in the signs and styles of representation, maps are always conceiving, articulating, and structuring the human world, which is biased towards, promoted by, and exerts influence upon particular sets of social relations, unquote. The reality in diasporic fiction, therefore, is not static. In Salman Rushdie, it is mutative and self-reflexive. It contrasts and contradicts. It is paradoxical and often confounding, intermingling with fantasy and magic realism. It is colored with darkness and derogatory suggestiveness in V.S. Naipal, whereas it is quotidian in Jhumpa Lahiri and Kiran Desai. The non-Aristotelian mode can truthfully bring out these many other different dimensions of diasporic creativeness, creative consciousness, creative consciousness. The issues pertaining to the diasporic qu quotidian as it is perceived and presented in or against the contrasting backdrop of the imaginary homeland initiates the questions of immigrant life and reality, its presentation, representation, or communication very often projected in general semantics through extended expression like map and territory, cartography, linguistic signs, 
and semiotics. Mundane in diasporic context indicates larger implications and subterranean political cultural overtones extensively discussed by the culture, culture historians, social and political scientists, and experts of economics and dexterously synthesized by the multidisciplinary critics, the non-Aristotle mode in this regard can prove a productive methodology. An analogy between the writer and cartographer will not be out of place here. Recourse to a system of signs is a common phenomenon between these two. A map, however, Kojibiski's, as Kojibiski's, Kojibiski's dictum goes, can only claim Kojibiski's dictum goes is not the territory. Jonathan Kalar, in Pursuit of Science, rightly asserts that we can only claim a map resembles what it repre represents if we take for granted the great granted and pass over in silence numerous complicated conventions, unquote. He further points out that the icon seems to be based on natural resemblances, but in fact, they are determined by semantic conventions and therefore considers the non-Aristotelian methodology beyond the fixity of Aristotelian logic. Diasporic modes of communication attributes the literary maps, a Foucauldian reading of the dialectic between knowledge and power. Maps or literary text, especially in the present context, codify, construct, or disseminate knowledge in such a way that indicate an objective and unbiased style of working. Nevertheless, mimetic presentation of reality cannot completely accommodate the reality with all its elusive nuances. Maps simply cannot be territory. Dennis Wood, Bohr, Dennis Wood, Bohr, and other critics, and cartographic theorists like Paul Carter underscored the fact that maps reveal more of politics and motifs of the map maker rather than the landscape itself. Non-Aristotelian mode of mode plays a role of crucial importance both in the process of specific action as well as approximation of a communication. What is specially to be noted in this regard is that general semantics and non-Aristotelian methodology, particularly in the context of the present paper, is inevitably linked with the diasporic mundane and therefore especially with the ordinary and the average. It should also be noticed that the process of abstraction in general semantics does not believe in the higher and the lower sort of categorization. Kojibiski's non-Aristotelian system, irrespective of the corroboration with or departure from the extension of the Aristotelian system, deploys this process of access, reality, access of reality with all its complex nuances. Word, therefore, for Kojibiski and the general semantics who followed him, already and always doesn't accommodate the reality in its totality. Words signify concepts, which in turn signify events, or entities, or relations in the world. Diasporic creative sensibility betrays its unwavering involvement in this complex process of abstraction and signification. A non-Aristotelian critical methodology in this connection, therefore, would bring out the hitherto unrevealed corners of authorial and textual dimensions. A sensitive reader can easily discern the linguistic departure of a diasporic text from the conventionally constructed or canonized texts. The process of signification or comprehension of multiple textualities embedded, is embedded in the text of diaspora. Non-Aristotelian orientation believes that all perceptual processes involve abstracting by our nervous system at different levels of complexity. Kojibiski's neurolinguistic, therefore linguistic system, therefore opens up fresher avenues to deconstruct diasporic process as well as semantic reconstruction of diasporic discourse. This mode offers a different set of the modes of evaluation by extension, by consideration of the actual facts in a particular situation. A man in his entirely entirety organism as a whole in the environment. Because of the basic premises of Kojibiskian general semantics is not the study of words or the study of meaning as these terms are ordinarily used but as Wendell Johnson rightly asserts, it is more concerned with the assumption underlying the symbol system and the personal and the cultural effects of their use. It is concerned with the pervasive problem of relation of language to reality, of word to fact, of theory to description, and of description to ideas. 
of the observer to the observed, of the knower to the knowable, unquote. Diasporic creative communication, therefore, is concerned with what Wendell Johnson writes in connection with general semantics and the role of language, the role of language in relation to predictability and evaluation and in relation to the control of events and to personal adjustment and social integration, non two, two, two minutes, one minute, I think. Non-Aristotelian mode of diasporic communication, therefore, can also reveal the underlying intentionality of the discourse and bring out the authorial motives also. The charges leveled against the immigrant writers apropos of their political politics of production, their lurking desire to cater to the needs <coughs> of their ulterior motives, or even to the imperial designs can also be ascertained. A non-Aristotelian interpretation will bring fresh views of Amitabh Ghosh and Rushdie, Rushdie's employment of history, anthropology, and ideology. Information content incorporated by the diasporic writer many times leads to further dividing a gulf, bringing out a gulf between the two groups of groups belonging to two different culture groups of the host culture and the immigrant culture, as it indiscriminately tends to generalize rather than particularize. The abstractions in the narration term, in, 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 in the narration terms, a diasporic statement into a general behavioristic pattern of whole host community instead of a statement on the idiosyncratic or atti atti attitudinal assertion of certain members of the community. This narration thus, in some way or the other, betrays the limitation of Aristotelian mimetic associations and insightful critique of Sauna Singh Baldwin's use of history and her partial, partial view of the narration of history in what in body remembers that the text will initially not only will initiate not only a debate about the incorporation of history, but will also spur an inter interrogation of her creative stance when the protagonist and the novel are divorced, are, are discovered inculcating the brutalities of history into the minds of young, innocent minds. A genuine literary discourse in its larger sense attempts to minimize the distances and differences and generate a sense of belonging and harmony amongst the different racial and ethnic groups. Thank you very much.